The markets see the NVIDIA earnings, the week's standout macro event risk. They don't like it at first as the surprise continues to contract, but ultimately find their way higher. We're left scratching our heads and wondering if there really is anything to do for investors before liquidity drains and everybody goes off for the holidays. That's where we find ourselves here as we begin to look at the end of what has been a quiet week on the macro front. I'm Ilya Spivak, head of Global Macro here at Tasty Live, and this is Macro Money. Uh, what we are going to do here uh, with all of this in mind is take a look at where things might be going next. It's a fairly quiet uh, calendar through the remainder of this week, not a whole lot on the docket to move things and wiggle them one way or the other. So instead, we're going to look ahead into next week. And this is where um, the expectation might be that very little happens. Uh, because, of course, we have a an abridged week. Uh, we have a situation where uh, by Thursday, U.S. markets are offline. Friday is going to be a um, an abridged session. And, of course, by Friday, uh, lots of market participants are already away from their desks. Uh, in fact, people are going to start to uh, file for the exits perhaps already by midweek. So uh, we have a somewhat quiet uh, possibility uh, here as participation drains away. Uh, and what's interesting uh, here is that sort of a participation drain is in some ways uh, – the kind of environment where you could see things quiet. Nobody wants to have uh, conviction. Uh, nobody wants to have uh, anything that they lay out uh, there expecting it is going to do much of anything because there's not a terrible amount of liquidity out there to really make things stick. Uh, however, nevertheless, uh, we do have a... Uh, situation where uh, those very same thin liquidity conditions might make for a situation where things actually get jumpier because a diminishing liquidity sort of situation just means there are fewer buyers and sellers at every uh, at every level. So as long as nothing happens, as long as the markets aren't rattled by anything, things are probably going to be uh, of the grass growing paint drying variety. But if there is something that rattles markets, then you have less liquidity and less depth at every price level. So if the markets then scramble for a move and there isn't smooth liquidity and smooth bids and offers across levels, well, then price action might be a lot choppier because the price will jump. So consider if you, for some reason, want to quickly get out of your position and you hit a market order to sell, but the quote at which you're trying to sell has inadequate liquidity and other people are, are selling at the same time, well, then you're going to get filled lower and maybe significantly. And of course, that if enough people are doing that, then the price gaps. So you end up with a sort of amplifying effect on volatility by the lack of participation. And that, of course, raises the very important question, is there something on the menu for next week that may well give us a situation where things get jumpy? Because this will be just the kind of environment where that kind of jumpy can be confused for conviction and make for extrapolated moves that stress people's portfolios. So this is 
uh, what we're going to focus on here, and indeed, such event risk presents itself. First, there is minutes from the Fed's uh, meeting uh, that we saw here uh, just after the U.S. presidential election in uh, the first days of November. This is the uh, policy statement uh, from the Fed uh, with the changes as relative to September's state, uh, statement highlighted. Uh, hat tip to Nick Timoros over at the Wall Street Journal that puts out these uh, edits here. You can, of course, do it yourself as well, but uh, this is nice and convenient where you can see the changes marked from statement to statement. Uh, and what you find is in this meeting, shouldn't be a surprise to most market watchers by now, the Fed walked back hawkish intent a little bit, watered things down somewhat. You can see that in uh, the adjustments made to this uh, language characterizing the economy. So uh, we can see here that job gains have turned into labor market conditions. We can see that they've generally eased, which is a somewhat more circumspect way of saying uh, what's going on rather than job gains have slowed. Uh, we can see that inflation has made progress, but not further progress. Uh, suggesting that uh, perhaps things were getting a little bit stickier. And we also see that this bit about the committee having gained greater confidence that inflation is moving toward 2%, that got taken out. And instead, the committee judges that the risks to achieving its employment and inflation goals are roughly in balance. In other words, a little bit less convincing, a little bit less uh, certain that the path to 2% is on autopilot. And of course, this presented itself in the press conference that Fed Chair Powell delivered after this uh, meeting of the FOMC. And just last week, again, at a speech in Texas where uh, he had a more pointed opportunity to comment on the economic uh, outlook, Fed Chair Powell likewise sort of turned the screws to a less dovish setting than what was there in September. Uh, in September, of course, the Fed began its rate cut cycle with an explosive 50 basis point adjustment. That's double what the Fed usually does. It typically moves in 25 basis point increments. It likewise laid out a forecast for 150 basis points in further rate cuts to follow uh, over the course of this year, 50 more basis of points this year and 100 basis points in 2025. Since then, uh, the Fed has issued 25 of that 150. That's what we just saw this month. That's this decision right here where we can see uh, the Fed decided to lower the target range by another quarter uh, of a percent. And the tone in the rhetoric seems to suggest, well, maybe we went a little far in September. Maybe we don't need to quite go as aggressively, or maybe the evidence that's accumulated since we did this suggests we need to cool our jets a bit. That, of course, is exactly what the markets were signaling. This is a little bit of a busy chart, but we'll go through it here step by step to unpack what's going on. You can see that Here's the beginning of September, and by this point, the markets have already discounted the likelihood that the Fed is going to begin cutting that month. In fact, the Fed began to lay the groundwork for those cuts as early as the beginning of July. We'll recall that the Fed a chair uh, appeared in that uh, congressional testimony, semi-annual testimony at the beginning of July, told everybody uh, that basically – the time to cut has come. And as we started to get soggier economic data into July and toward the beginning of August, we can see here this dip in uh, inflation expectations. We have uh, the markets going, oh, well, what are they having a sense of urgency? Did they miss the boat? Are they 
perhaps going to go into some sort of a recessionary situation, and that's why they're finally ready to cut. And we can see that as the Fed massaged this story, bond yields go down. So what you see down here is the 10, the 2, and the 30-year bond yield. That's this right here, as well as the dollar. This is the dollar index in green. And then up here, we have inflation expectations as they present themselves in the bond market. This is the difference between nominal and real or tips yields. When you take that difference, you get the inflation coefficient that adjusts you from nominal to real, and that's the bond market's real-time inflation expectation, uh, in this case for 5, 10, and 20 years. And what you find is when the Fed starts talking up the rate cuts, yields understandably come down. And when the data seems to think that maybe they're even too late on those rate cuts, inflation expectations decline, suggesting maybe they're actually going to miss the boat. This was the uh, uh, scare in stock markets that we saw at this same time. In fact, uh, if we take a look at what the S&P 500 looked like at that time, that would be this scare right here, late, uh, late, uh, let's call it July into August. This, of course, was when the Fed made that uh, announcement at the semi-annual testimony. And you can see as the Fed pledges cuts, you have markets actually not liking that because there is this sense that maybe the Fed is missing the boat by this point. Very different story once the Fed actually begins to cut in September. By this point, U.S. economic data has actually started to improve relative to forecasts as of late August. And the idea that maybe there is some sort of a recessionary scare starts to fade away. The yield curve, which is this um, yellow uh, bars uh, bit right here, that's the 10 to 2 year spread, that starts to steepen. Inflation expectations start to rise. Bond yields and the dollar rise in tandem, all of which is telling you that the market perceives what the Fed is doing as inflationary and says, oh, you're going to cut 50 basis points and tell us you're going to do another percent uh, and a half in cuts. Meanwhile, the economy is improving. This is going to be inflation. You're going to have to dial back how many rate cuts you're going to have to do later. And this really is where this is coming from. This is why the Fed is diluting things a little bit. As you get this rise in inflation expectations, and you get a rise in yields, and you get a rise in the dollar, and you get a steepening of the yield curve, the message is, hold on now. This is not exactly as dovish of an environment. You're not going to be able to do all of these things that you told us in September. In response, of course, you get this significant decline in uh, long-end bonds and a parallel rise in yields. Here's the significant then parallel rise in the dollar. This is it against the euro as a kind of most liquid counterpoint to get a sense for these moves. Gold takes a little bit of time to uh, come around. This is the Fed's announcement right here. Gold has kind of a strange move higher disconnected from what's going on at the same time in yields and the dollar. It doesn't usually rise when uh, the uh, yields and the dollar rise uh, because, of course, gold yields nothing. It is a natural foil for fiat currency. And uh, when fiat currency and yields go up, that's typically kryptonite for gold. But nevertheless, it manages to make its way higher, perhaps around the uh, uncertainty risk linked to the presidential election, because, of course, as soon as that presidential election occurs in early November, gold snaps right back to form and ends up after the immediate aftermath of the election exactly where it would have uh, landed in the wake of that September Fed announcement. So eventually gold finds its way lower once all of the dust settles. Interestingly, we'll take a look back at stocks 
right here. We can clearly see a, a sort of soggy rebound this week. But last week, what we ended up with, once we add up these significant declines here, is actually the sharpest sell-off in 10 weeks. And we can see all of it came basically on two days. And that was that Powell speech last week where he made the slight uh, hawkish adjustment narrative more overt, saying, hey, hold on a minute now. Looks like the markets are telling us that things are reflating. Looks like the economic data is getting warmer. Hold on. Perhaps we don't have the ingredients that we thought we did. Let's make sure that we reiterate we are not going to be cutting if that jeopardizes the move to 2% inflation. We are not on autopilot. And we will withhold a rate uh, cut if need be. As you can see here, stock markets did not like that at all. Once we got the election spike right here, once the certainty of the outcome crystallized and the markets kind of breathed a sigh of relief about what was the biggest event risk for the year, most likely in the minds of a lot of investors, once that was in the rear view, we got this relief rally. And then once Powell had his say and said, ah, actually, rates might be higher than you all thought, we hear you. We see you making this adjustment. We see where you're telling us to go. We will uh, endorse it accordingly. Once that occurs, stocks get kind of wrong-footed and come back down for a significant sell-off, ultimately, on the week. So there is a level of sensitivity here. And as we get these minutes from that November meeting, out of which this pivot and the subsequent speechifying from Powell come, the risk is that the committee has a sort of buyer's remorse on rate cuts. That the more combative statements we've heard, for example, from uh, Governor Michelle Bowman, she spoke yesterday again and offered a more hawkish narrative than even the Fed chair. And of course, she pointedly dissented for the first time, if memory serves, from 2005 that a governor dissented at the September meeting saying, we don't need 50 basis points and cuts. The economy is too hot. A quarter point move will do. It'll be very interesting to read these minutes then and see whether the Fed made the adjustment in this rhetoric subsequently, because the conversation was, you know, we really went too far. We shouldn't have done all that. We, we're going to need to claw back some of what we've uh, offered here as far as dovish guidance and as far as uh, dovish steps already taken. And if that's the case, if that's how this leans, the question then becomes, well, do stocks not like that? Do we get another down step? And of course, with the benefit of thin liquidity, the move benefit, in quotes, uh, the, the significance of the impact may look outsized because that diminishing uh, participation might well amplify any kind of a scramble in the markets. Beyond the minutes, the next bit in this same story comes by way of the PCE inflation report. This is going to be the same uh, report that we always uh, toss around as the Fed's favorite inflation indicator uh, in the financial news media. And uh, those of us that think, talk, write about uh, the markets, that's how this number is characterized. And indeed, when the Fed publishes its forecasts, it benchmarks to this rather than uh, the consumer price index, which is the more uh, common international standard. And the expectation is that we're going to get an uptick here, that uh, we're going to see headline inflation edge up to 2.2%, uh, and that we are going to get headline uh, probably helped along by the diminishing negative influence from energy, but that the situation in core will again end up being 2.7%, which is 
rounding errors aside, essentially unchanged from the prior month. Now, where this becomes particularly interesting is we are looking at uh, then four consecutive months that disinflation has not occurred at the core level, which is, of course, where the Fed wants it to occur. It doesn't have much agency over global food and energy prices and it can't do much about housing, which it has basically locked in place with its own rate hike cycle. Rates probably need to come down to unlock it and get turnover to bring prices down. But that core services area that's approximated by core CPI, that's what the Fed is looking at. And if there's not progress there, that, of course, reinforces the sense that maybe they have a reason to backpedal. We, of course, already saw as much in the CPI report uh, last week, which right on time gave us slight upside surprises on both headline and on core, a little wiggle higher on both. Now, these were not unexpected, broadly speaking, but if we look at the dynamics for BCE, at the bottom here is the monthly change, uh, along with the year-on-year -year change. We can see September's pop was a significant rise, uh, larger, in fact, than anything we'd seen since April. But really, it's the direction of travel and the pace there that might give you some pause. Up here in the red bars is the six-month annualized percent change, and in the blue, the three-month. You can see from the higher frequency bars here that from July, the rate is actually going the wrong way. It's actually rising here. And that tells you that the pace of disinflation is hitting a wall when we look at the larger numbers, the year-on-year -year numbers. Now, the six-month numbers are still coming cautiously down, uh, the peak there in June, and we're edging down. But... If the three-month is starting to go the wrong way, the Fed may well find reason for a pause. And again, the upshot there becomes more of this. So this perhaps explains why the bonds are so reluctant to keep going lower. The risk would be that actually after this consolidation, rather than the much-anticipated bounce, they actually push downward. The expectation for the dollar, again, despite the fact that it seems to be finding a bottom, might be that it uh, continues to extend lower. That would be the risk. For gold, it would be that you meet this resistance here, and maybe even before you meet it, find a reason to retreat. And then for stocks, where you seemingly have a... Um, sensitivity to rate cuts getting factored out of the equation, you have downside surprise risk. And that is macro money for today. As ever, uh, we'll typically be here Monday through Thursday, right after overtime, uh, a show that I co-host with Dylan Radigan and Chris Vecchio. Next week will be a uh, an abridged week, obviously, uh, because of the holidays. I am likewise on Futures Power Hour Mondays and Fridays uh, with Chris, on with uh, Victor for The Price of Truth on Wednesdays, Victor and Tom for First Call on Sundays, writing for the news and insights portion of TastyLive.com, and opining sporadically on the platform formerly known as Twitter and on Blue Sky at Ilya Spivak. Thanks very much for joining. Macromoney's back next week. Take care.